गुड इवनिंग गाइज कैन आई जस्ट हैव यूर थम्स अप इफ दी ऑडियो विजुअल इज वर्किंग वेल विच मीन्स यू कैन सी मी यू कैन हेयर मी एंड एंड ऑफकोर्स यू नो यू कैन हेयर सी मी राइटिंग ऑन दिस बोर्ड सो प्लीज जस्ट गिव मी अ थम्स अप इफ दी ऑडियो विजुअल इज ओके सो दैट वी कैन जस्ट गेट स्टार्टेड और फेयर इनफ सो आई थिंक दडियो विजुअल पार्ट इज ऑल ओके एंड यू गाइज आर इन सो वी कैन जस्ट गेट स्टार्टेड now this is a session that's dedicated to the upcoming fmg exam and the mission is to make you score that 150 that's critical and that's going to decide you know of course your future uh perhaps you know it's not just 150 what our target is definitely you go above 150 because somewhere down the line the same score is sometimes even useful in you know getting an internship for the fmg students as well and perhaps you know the same knowledge is going to be carried up when you want to appear for the other exams so perhaps the target is to let you score maximum so what i've done in this session that i've taken up some mcqs from areas which i suppose would be uh, pro- probably asked in the upcoming exam i have prepared these topics for you know i have touched these areas looking at the papers from last few years and i've specifically tried to touch some of those topics which are hot topics so without wasting much of time because the exam is just around the corner we'll just begin with a very easy one a kind of a warm up question as i always start up with so any idea who is called as the father of orthopedics so so people who are attending live watching so please feel free to comment the, the the chat box is visible to me so you can just put in your your comments on the chat box and perhaps no negative marking in my class i always say uh this is just a class so you have the license to commit mistakes so you can just try putting in the answers that come to your mind in the chat box and perhaps uh, the chat box is visible to me so i'll try adding up to your knowledge so so any any guesses on it okay max is nicholas henry it's absolutely right max so it's nicholas henry who's called as the father of orthopedics and he's called as the father of orthopedics because he coined the term this term orthopedics was actually coined by this man nicholas henry and let me tell you he is also the gentleman who wrote the first book in the field of orthopedics so perhaps for these contributions he is called as the father of orthopedics but simultaneously i will take you know this duty to inform you a little bit about these other people also whose names are written over here this gentleman dr bowler he is called as the father of traumatology now please this word traumatology trauma is an english word meaning wound so study of wounds fractures that's traumatology injuries okay dr robert jones was no less fellow he is that gentleman who introduced x rays to the field of orthopedics so this is again a great contribution because an orthopedic surgeon imagining life without x rays terribly difficult so for this particular contribution this gentleman is rather called as the father of modern orthopedics clear with that so please do remember these names because sometimes they can simply be mcqs in your exams and you end up losing point over nothing so that was the whole idea of discussing about these names and this one particular name i have just left no way can i leave this name also h o thomas now this gentleman also has some very important contributions against his name he gave us a very very popular splint we use in orthopedics for immobilizing lower limb fractures that's called a thomas splint he is the same gentleman who has given us those cervical collars that are used for cervical spine injury and against his name there is a very important test that's called a thomas test this is basically a method to detect a flexion deformity at the hip now sometimes the hip joint is fixed in flexion and spine is masking the deformity to take away the contribution of the spine and to pick up that flexion deformity at the hip we use this thomas test 
this is just a repeat question from one of your exams that which test you perform to detect flexion deformity at the hip and the answer was thomas test so these are all the contributions given by dr h o thomas and for his contributions uh, this gentleman he is called the father of british orthopedics so he belonged to uk london and uh, he had these contributions against this name so he is called as the father of british orthopedics so these are just some important names from the field of orthopedics to warm you up all right so i'll just move a little further now perhaps a lot of questions have been coming of late from fractures involving the small bones of hand and foot initially fmg was more or so about major bone fractures femur tibia but i think the examiners are pretty much exhausted asking about those bones so now what's going hot up with the examiners are actually the small bone fractures so so anyone who can let me know the commonest carpal bone to fracture fairly easy one yes yes exactly exactly oh, jaydeb has clicked d d d so he's shouting at me sir it's skip but full marks to you absolutely right so that's a fairly easy one but let me tell you this bone scaphoid uh is of course the commonest carpal bone to fracture when this bone would fracture the mode of injury would generally be a fall on an outstretched hand and it would generally be the waist of scaphoid that generally fractures okay most of the people would be in this age group pedalo signs so that is the clinical scenario waist area now i must also point out to you what is this waist area in this scaphoid yes so this particular bone here is the scaphoid scaphoid has basically a distal pole scaphoid has a proximal pole and this particular area in the center is what i am calling as the waist so generally you find fractures in the waist of the scaphoid now this particular fracture you are very clear uh, you know abdul that it is prone to avascular necrosis i know but actually this is a fracture that is particularly popular because of the complications it produces and they are generally the part of your exam now this bone here is the scaphoid and by the side of it you have the bone lunate now as i told you scaphoid would have a distal pole and a proximal pole now you have the blood supply of the scaphoid that is very very peculiar going near the distal end of the radius here you have the radial artery now this radial artery would give a branch that would travel through the distal pole cross the waist and go on to supply the proximal pole so that is the pattern in which you know blood supply reaches the scaphoid now you can very well imagine that just in case there is going to be a fracture that's going to involve this waist area in the scaphoid the blood supply to this proximal pole is going to be gone so this proximal pole is going to undergo avascular necrosis so abdul the question that came up last time that which part of the scaphoid undergoes avian as a complication of the waist fracture so avian would generally involve the proximal pole Now, wherever avian is one problem, means there is some problem with the blood supply. The other complication is bound to be non-avian. So these are some of the common problems we find with the scaphoid fracture. So I hope you guys are clear with the common problems, okay? And 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 you guys are clear with the ah uh, uh, the 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 reason why these complications happen. And Mira, please, lunet is not the commonest carpal bone to fracture. Scaphoid fractures. far 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 more common than lunate fractures lunate will be somewhere down 3 or 4 third or fourth commonest carpal bone to fracture so clear with with with, with your queries guys and clear with the messages i want to convey about this scaphoid fracture because a lot of questions come from this area okay and i don't think i need to tell you the treatment part for this fracture as far as treatment of this fracture is concerned you give a plaster in the glass holding position this is called a glass holding cast 
just like you hold a glass in your hand that is the position which you give a plaster and that's called a glass holding cast so glass holding cast is what you give for scapoid fractures so i hope you guys are thoroughly clear with this very very important injury scapoid fracture clear with that all right so from the scapoid fracture i'll move a little up now although fractures have been uh, okay mira absolutely right most commonly dislocated is lunate i give it to you i give it to you so a dislocation at the wrist would be centered around lunate but a fracture would be centered around scaphoid so you are right you are right fine fine but we were talking of fractures so 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 uh scaphoid was more so in the picture all right now a lot of questions of late you know i have been also finding around you know this area of soft tissue injuries because orthopedics is just not you know about dealing with the fractures soft tissue injuries are also an e e equally important part of you know uh, the things that come to the orthopedic surgeons as problems brought by the people now if you ask me the commonest muscle or the commonest tendon in the body to rupture i would label it as rotator cuff the most common you can say the tendon or you can say the muscle rupture overall in the body that's rotator cuff so first of all checking little bit of your anatomy knowledge so which of the following does not form the rotator cuff muscle okay sits s i t s s i t s s i t s so please abdul people who uh depend upon mnemonics eventually falter in life mnemonic can so easily be killed like see s i t s so as per your mnemonic all these four are part of the rotator cuff so idea is to know the reality that is the whole you know game so fair enough most of you have the idea so there is a small catch here the answer is tv is major because actually the muscle is tv is minor not major absolutely right absolutely right so actually all these are muscles of the rotator cuff and it's tv is minor that is actually the muscle not tv is major now all these muscles in the rotator cuff can rupture supraspinatus is the most common tendon rupture out of them all so this is the commonest tendon rupture in the body supraspinatus so in case there will be a tear in the rotator cuff the tendon that would usually rupture would be the supraspinatus clear with that now there was a question in the aims paper little time back that out of them all which is the forgotten tendon of the rotator cuff so this mcq was there in the aims paper little time back so any idea which is the forgotten tendon in the rotator cuff yes so which is the forgotten tendon out of them all so which tendon is taken as the forgotten tendon of the rotator cuff any idea any idea because mind you sometimes questions spill over a names question can appear in the fmg exam also especially if it's a direct question like this that the forgotten tendon in the rotator cuff is taken as subscapularis absolutely right and i'll tell you the reason also because lot of hidden lesions you find in the subscapular it's like lesions that are generally under diagnosed not apparent on mri not apparent clinically so that's why subscapularis we generally take it as the forgotten tendon of the rotator cuff perfect perfect okay now in case rotator cuff tendon rupture the treatment would involve copic tendon repair now please this is a very very you can say a recent advance in the field of orthopedics that now we have those cameras that can be put inside a joint and under that camera vision things can be repaired so these are those latest technology things you know that have now started hitting the orthopedic market and they are now very very successful procedures so this is what we do in these tendon repairs arthroscopic tendon repair and with that success of tendon repair many many people are getting these surgeries done and that's why these questions are now attacking your exams also 
Now we'll just raise the level a little more. We'll just raise this level a little more. I think some problem with the chat part. Okay. So I'll just raise the level a little more. So I'll just explain to you a little bit of the anatomy of the calf. So this muscle right at the top will be supraspinatus. Uh, this muscle in the front will be the subscapularis and these muscles at the back are the infrared DTDs. Now when this muscle in the front would contract, this humerus will be pulled into internal rotation. So this is basically what is the function of subscapularis. Now you can very well imagine these muscles at the back, the infra and the teres, when they are going to contract shoulder is rather going to be pushed into external rotation so this is what happens with uh, teres minor and infraspinatus so they are basically external rotators so subscapularis internal rotator infra and teres external rotator hence the word rotator rotator cuff because these muscles are rotating the shoulder and this particular muscle supraspinatus is this horizontal muscle on the top so this is the muscle that initiates abduction of the shoulder so first 15 degrees of abduction at the shoulder is what you tend to have from supraspinatus clear with that clear with that clear with that so so are you guys clear with this anatomy and can you see this is teres minor not teres major so i hope you are clear with the answer also here you are clear with all the things okay can I have that thumbs up from you guys? You guys are clear with everything. And, and I hope my chat box is also working well. Uh, so please just, just give me a thumbs up if you guys are all okay with this. So you've understood the anatomy of the rotator cuff. You understood the function of these muscles also very well. Okay, fair enough. Because now the questions will get a little, little tougher on this topic. Okay, so 70 years old male has come to you. And he has a massive retracted chronic irreparable rotator cuff tear. So what do you think would be the best line of management? So please read these lines again. Chronic irreparable retracted massive rotator cuff tear. So what is the story? I'll tell you. Initially, the arthroscopic options were not so advanced. So the surgical results were very bad. With the advent of arthroscopy, the surgery has become so minimally invasive that results have dramatically improved. So a lot of people who had these tears earlier, who never went to the doctor, looking at the results of the neighbors, they started turning up to the doctors, maybe years after their injuries. So eventually this person has come to you late down the course now because now it's a chronic tear and the muscle is retracted and gone and now it's almost like an irreparable tear. So what would be the best scenario in this case? There is a 70 years old man who has come to you now years after his injury. First thing, leave it conservative. Tell him that first you did not come, now I am not going to see. Or no, opt for tendon transfers. Use some other tendon to build up the lost tendon like supraspinatus. Or do a shoulder replacement. Oh no, 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 do a reverse shoulder replacement. Yes, so, so, so Jadip says leave conservative. All right. Any more people who wish to participate? Any more people who wish to participate? Uh, recent advances I specifically think are important uh, from the context of the upcoming exam. Okay. Because you know we are all getting up for the next pattern that is going to have at least you know some contribution from the latest literature. All right. So, so Abdul also says leave this person conservative. All right. All right. Okay, Chandan also says leave it. So most of the people are of the view that considering this age, you leave this patient conservative. Please, no, 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 no. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Trust me, uh, even in the elderly age group, people want to be fit and healthy nowadays. They also want to enjoy their life. So no way can you leave this person conservative. This is what you have to opt for in such cases. Something that's called reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So please, please, please. What is reverse shoulder arthroplasty? See this picture. In glenoid, I have attached the humeral head. And, and, and humeral head I have removed to build up a glenoid. 
So please, what I'm trying to say, I'll just tell you. So that is the scapula and this is the humeral head articulating with the scapula. Now this would be the center of rotation of the shoulder joint. Now what we do in reverse shoulder arthroplasty, we attach the head of the humerus here and we cut this humerus and we attach the glenoid cavity here. So this, we, I have reversed the articulations. Now this would be the new center of rotation of the shoulder. So once I reverse the articulations, I attach the head here, I attach the, uh, uh, the glenoid here, this will be the new center of rotation. So can you see the center of rotation has gone down and out? So please, going right on top of the shoulder, you have a muscle called deltoid. So as you pull the center of rotation down, that deltoid muscle is also pulled, stretched. And muscles are just like rubber bands. When you stretch a muscle, that becomes more powerful. So please, can you see supraspinatus? It starts the abduction at the shoulder. Once you cross 15 degrees of abduction at the shoulder, it is deltoid that takes over. So with supraspinatus gone, initiating the abduction becomes a problem. So that is the problem the gentleman would be having. Lifting up the shoulder will be difficult. So he'll use the other limb to lift up the shoulder and then he'll be able to move the shoulder. So just in case you stretch this deltoid by changing the center of rotation of the shoulder, a stretched deltoid will become damn powerful. And then even first 15 degrees of abduction, that initiation of abduction can all only and only now be done by deltoid. So this is what is reverse shoulder arthroplasty doing. Converting this muscle deltoid into supraspinatus, that muscle is gone. Supraspinatus. So that action of supraspinatus can just be now taken over by deltoid because you have moved the center of the rotation down, so you've stressed the deltoid, making it more powerful. So are you guys clear with that? So I, I, I hope my voice part is also now okay. Uh, I hope my voice part is also now okay guys and I, I hope you're clear with this concept, how this reverse shoulder arthroplasty works. Okay, so, so Meera, Mehek, Abdul, Jayadev, clear with this part, clear with everything till here, clear with everything till here. So I hope you guys are clear with everything till here. Any queries from the area that has been covered till now? Koichi Samaj Minayo? Clear? Tokmisi, clear with that? Perfect now, perfect now, perfect now. So I'll move just a little further and take up another very, very interesting question. Shown below is a picture of a plaster around this wrist area. So looking at this plaster, you have to guess the diagnosis. Okay. So, so looking at this plaster, you, know, you have to make it out. Like, what is the likely uh, injury this patient has sustained? So can I have some people contributing to this one? Uh, so looking at this plaster, what do you think is the likely injury you guys are dealing with? Yes, looking at this plaster, you have to form a diagnosis in your mind. Still my video is lagging, it should be because uh, I am also watching my own video and that's not lagging much. Okay, so so people who are finding a little lag in video, just click the refresh button on your screen because there's a video running in front of me also and perhaps you know it's going fine. Or I'll just do one thing. Okay, so I'll tell you this one also guys. So please, some people are thinking this scaphoid fracture because there's a glass holding cast. No, please, 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 please. See, this is certainly not a Coley's cast. In Coley's fracture that is shown in this x-ray, you give a hand shaking cast. And that is absolutely the opposite one. So this is no way that Coley's cast. Now people who are thinking this scaphoid cast are wrong. And if you think the diagnosis here is Bennett's fracture, Okay, that's also not the scenario. This is more or less looking like, oops, 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 sorry. This is more or less looking like a thumb spica cast. 
okay uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what a thumb spike cast is and this thumb spike cast is generally given for a fracture like Bennett fracture a scaphoid fracture cast is given in a glass holding position but what you specifically find is that the thumb interphalangeal joint would generally be left free so that is the crux here okay so this is not a hand shaking cast please glass holding i could still accept it's looking a little bit like glass holding but it's certainly not a hand shaking cast so please what you have in hand shaking cast is palmar flexion at the wrist plus a medial deviation at the wrist okay but what you see over here in glass holding cast is absolutely opposite so what you have over here is a lateral deviation at the wrist plus dorsiflexion at the wrist okay so this is more so looking like a scaphoid cast but in scaphoid cast one important thing the thumb interphalangeal joint is free this interphalangeal joint will be totally free so actually you have to zoom into this area to see whether the thumb interphalangeal joint is free or not in thumb spica cast the ip joint interphalangeal joint in the thumb is immobilized clear otherwise both would have nearly the same plaster so you just have to see if this this is movable it is a glass holding cast if the thumb interphalangeal joint is not movable it is a thumb spica cast and thumb spica cast will go in for a bennett fracture so that's how you should be differentiating clear with that and yes i must tell you a little bit about these bennett and rolando fractures also because they have again been a part of your paper of late there is something called a bennett fracture and there is something called a rolando fracture in the thumb so these are basically fractures involving the thumb they are both intra articular fractures means fractures involving the joint these are intra-articular fractures that involve the base of this first metacarpal and first metacarpal basically means the metacarpal of the thumb and both of them Bennett and Rolando they are same area of fractures intra-articular fractures of the base of the first metacarpal the difference between the two is the shape of the fracture Bennett is taken as an oblique shaped fracture while Rolando is best taken up as a Y-shaped fracture like if you see this is Y getting formed so this is Rolando and if you see this oblique type of a shape this is Bennett well the problem with the oblique shape that it can slip displacement is usually the rule in a Bennett fracture but ek bar ye bhi pucha gaya hai. this question has also been there in the FMG exam that which is that muscle that displaces the Bennett's fracture and that's the answer abductor pollicis longus so it's abductor pollicis longus which is taken as that muscle that generally displaces this Bennett's fracture clear with that so are you guys comfortable till here and I hope that that lag of the video is also now okay with most of you clear with that clear with that that lag of the video is also gone yes so people who are watching i hope you guys are comfortable in that lag of the video is also now gone and you are able to uh, grasp of the things that are now being discussed all right so we'll move to another one so two vehicles they sustained a head-on collision like this now we are presuming that although this collision happened because both people were on a mobile phone they were wearing the seat belts for their safety okay so, so although this is not the right thing to presume you know of course in this scenario because when people are on phone they will be negligent not using the seat belts either but but not always many times people are in the habit of wearing seat belts toward a chalam at least you know they are afraid but but mobile they cannot resist so these people 
they were on their mobile they had a head on collision and, and fortunately they were in seat belts but still they are prone to some kind of an injury so what would be that pattern of injury that you expect in these people yes very good nana chandan seeker okay you think extension distraction injury no 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 this is the best pick flexion distraction injury so can anyone name that fracture that is going to happen in this scenario so which fracture are these people actually going to get in this particular scenario so can anyone give me that name of that fracture yes can you guys help me out with that exact name of that fracture or or do you want me to help you out okay no problem no problem see extension at the neck is what you get when there are rear end collisions like someone hitting you from the back and someone hits your vehicle from the back your vehicle starts moving your neck falls back and this particular pattern of uh, injury is what is popular as like a whiplash injury okay collisions a hyper extension at the neck Now, what I want to find in these head-on collisions is something very different. Here, you tend to find a very, very uh, popular, I would say, a kind of a yes fracture. This is popularly known as the chance fracture, after the name of this person called G. Q. Chance. So, this is that classical injury that you get on head-on collision of two vehicle, especially if people are wearing seat belts. so sometimes vaguely this injury itself as it is gets referred to as like a seat belt injury the mechanism of injury as i told you tends to be flexion distraction happening at the spine which is also called a jack knife injury mechanism so that's the jack knife so basically jack knife is contracted in front and distracted at the back so anterior part of the vertebral column is collapsing in flexion and the posterior part of the vertebral column is opening up in distraction so this flexion distraction kind of an injury is what you call as chance fracture and this is what you tend to see in head on collision of two vehicles that's also called as a seat belt injury generally d12 L1 vertebra are the areas that are involved and this is a very very dangerous injury pattern so that is why you are supposed to refrain from the use of mobiles while you are driving clear with that clear with that okay fair enough fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. now another very very important topic i would like to discuss with you guys okay uh that's you know concerning this particular thing that's called scoliosis this topic now the whole idea of discussing this topic that of late i have seen lot of questions from this area in the neat pg paper the inict paper and i think right now fmg people are the only people who are bit spared i would say just bit spared because it's not that these questions are not penetrated your area but on a much milder scale but i'm expecting some more questions to come up as you know more fmg exams are conducted because i have seen fmg exam also getting difficult day by day so just trying to test your knowledge a little bit on this little difficulty guys it'll try simplifying for you structural scoliosis is associated with all of the following deformities except so what is it that you don't find in a case of a structural scoliosis yes so please 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 help me out help me out that what is it that's not going to be a part of the deformities in case you're dealing with a case of structural scoliosis yes 
Okay, Lordosis. So Chandan wants to go with Lordosis. Any more people who wish to participate? Kyphosis. So Naina says Kyphosis. So any more people who wish to try? Okay. Again, Lordosis. Lordosis. Okay, Lordosis. Okay. All right. Fine. So I'll I'll tell you. My pick here will be Kyphosis. This is not a part. Coronal tilt certainly is a part because because scoliosis is the lateral deviation of the spine. Scoliosis, scoliosis. So this lateral deviation of the spine is what is scoliosis. Let me tell you in a simple way. When you have a lateral deviation in the spine, that's crossing 10 degrees, that's exactly where we say that this is now a case of scoliosis. Okay. Okay, you mean to say my video is not clear? All right. So connected. So let me just give me a minute to try and change and, and refresh my internet. Then maybe a little bit of problem on my side that could be an issue. Let me see if I can do something to all right. I'll just try to refresh my internet then. So just give me a minute. I'm trying to improve upon the technical issue so that we can continue with the class in a more or less uninterrupted manner. I think now things would be a little better. Just give me a minute so that you know I can just improve upon the internet connection part also. Okay, so from my side, this is connected. Okay. So I'll just reconnect once again. I have just open this up. Yeah. So guys, is the internet now okay? Okay, Chandan, is everything fine now? So I hope there is no lag. So I'll just just continue from where I was. I was talking of scoliosis. So what you have in scoliosis is a lateral deviation in the spine. And this would generally be crossing an angle of 10 degrees. Okay. Now scoliosis is broadly categorized into two parts. One is a structural scoliosis and one is a postural scoliosis. Okay. In postural scoliosis, what you find that this scoliotic curve 
disappears as you bend forwards in fact this is a designated clinical test that's called adams test that helps you to decide this is just a postural curve and this is not actually a real scoliotic because a real scoliotic curve a structural scoliotic curve is strictly taken as a developmental anomaly of the spine the spine is not developed naturally so what you have here in the coronal plane there is lateral deviation as we have just discussed in the horizontal plane there is more of lordosis okay and of course in the sagittal plane sorry in the sagittal plane i would say there is more of lordosis so in the sagittal plane you find more of lordosis in the horizontal plane you find abnormal vertebral rotation so basically in scoliosis all the three planes are defective in the sagittal means front back plane you have more of lordosis in the spine in the sideways plane you have this lateral tilt and in the horizontal plane that cross section you find the vertebrae abnormally rotated so this is what makes up you know exactly scoliosis that all three planes would have be having the default clear with that so that is what is structural scoliosis and generally you would find adolescents being involved with scoliosis so adolescent idiopathic type of a thing developmental anomaly is what is scoliosis with adolescent involved clear enough with that okay all right perfect enough so going on to another very interesting question so this is a photograph of the national sap of bangladesh and you can see the sampoti with some kind of an amputation that has been performed on here now this particular amputation is depicted because you know the doctors believe that there is very good functional outcome to this amputation so you can very well see that they have made a fork with the forearm bones okay so can you help me know the name of this amputation well well dear om uh scoliosis or scoliosis only you know when will come in your exam and you will know the answer okay so there will be troubles for you so perhaps uh, let the other interested people discuss and meanwhile you can go and watch whatever you wish to so no 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 you know one is after you to study there but people who wish to study please let them participate so yes so people who can uh, answer this one please please do please do i'm i'm waiting for them to answer so this particular amputation that you can see would most closely simulate which of the following amputations so parts okay nine says jo part sanjay says jo part uh, no actually i'll tell you these three are amputations you have in the lower limb and this is actually an amputation of the upper limb and here only one amputation is an amputation of the upper limb and that is krukenberg amputation this is actually krukenberg so basically what you do with the krukenberg this is an amputation where you go through the forearm bones making a fork with the forearm bones and let me tell you the biggest part it's a functional amputation so which means you can pick up objects with this fork so so it's a functional kind of an amputation you can pick up objects with this fork now since it's a functional amputation this is specifically an amputation that is preferred in blind people see blind people are already having a disability so you have to give them the maximum level of rehabilitation okay okay so so that's why we prefer this in the blind mcq mcq just an old mcq from the fmg exam clear the other amputations are amputations from the lower limb see jo parts is an amputation when you go through the tarsal bones lis frank is the amputation when you go through the tarso metatarsal joint and symes is the amputation when you go through the ankle so going through the ankle that will be called symes so going through the tarso metatarsal joint that will be called as lis frank and you going through the tarsal bones that will be called as the jo parts amputation 
clear with that so i hope you're clear with this one also okay so that's the scenario you're going through the anchor that will be signs you're going through the tarsus that will be chow part you're going through this tarso metatarsal joint here you would have the lis frank amputation so these are the levels in the foot for these lower limb amputation so i hope this picture clears up the whole story done with that done with that done with that so so couple of questions on the nerve injuries because one question from nerve injuries definitely going to be there take my word on it so before i start with these couple of questions on nerve injuries so guys there were some internet issues you guys were facing and you know little bit of video lag and everything is that part now all okay can i have that thumbs up from you guys so that i know did the chat box is visible to me so i hope you guys are all okay yes okay perfect enough pal for letting me know all clear all clear wonderful so you guys are all comfortable with me till here fair enough so left over 15 20 minutes you know we can spend up on discussing this extremely important area of nerve injuries now this is one of my favorite question a patient has sustained something called a montagia fracture M montagia fracture montagia fracture see this is what a montagia fracture is so what is a montagia fracture to be specific we have a fracture involving the proximal third of ulna so i hope you can see this ulna broken proximal third of ulna gone but that's not the whole story you also have a dislocation simultaneously that will be involving the proximal radio ulnar joint i am sure you can very well see this radio ulnar joint dislocated here that's exactly what you call as a montagia fracture so now you have to keep in mind that this is a patient where you have got a montagia fracture so you have to tell me which of the following sign is expected to be there if there is a nerve injury yes so please 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 uh, chandni it's not druj it is proximal radio nerve joint not distal radio nerve joint okay so so which nerve injury okay stalin says ulnar nerve injury okay does the does a vote for a wrist drop does a vote for lack of extension at mcp joints naina says so rohit says again wrist drop okay as says pi in posterior interosseous nerve chandni says radial nerve so so you are getting it but you are not getting it clearly so i tell you this would be the best pick here so please the nerve that is injured is posterior interosseous nerve this is a case of pin injury pin would wind around the neck of the radius this is where you have pin so when this radial head would dislocate there will be a chances of injuring the posterior interosseous nerve so now we come down to this point as to what is the function of posterior interosseous nerve or from where the hell has this nerve come here so i tell you posterior interosseous nerve to be specific is a branch or i would say rather the continuation of a more major nerve that's actually the radial radial medial nerve i think you very well know what is radial nerve a continuation of the posterior cord of what you guys know as that brachial plexus so that's from where i would start from the brachial plexus and i go down and trace this radial nerve and how this changes into pin and how the pin is over here around the neck of radius and it gets injured and then if the pin gets injured which of the following sign would come up okay so before i trace this course of radial nerve to you i'll just go back here to the same cq that same mcq and and let me tell you that mcq is a very easy one because anyway if you had a little bit of idea that what's expected to be injured is the uh, posterior interosseous nerve or the radial nerve even that mcq would be very easy for you even in that scenario because because i'll tell you the choices are so varied see a thumb is something that you have in medial nerve palsy when you know this this choice is already gone because this is not a case of median nerve palsy okay 
and perhaps loss of adduction abduction of the finger this is what you call as that card test paper test and this is something that you find in ulnar nerve palsy so these signs of some other nerve injury so if you know that maybe radial or the pa nerve or whatsoever is injured you know the answer is between b and c so that is generally the confusion you guys get into okay but how to decide between radial nerve injury pa and injury and what exactly is happening in radial nerve injury and what exactly is happening in pa and let me also bring that clarity to you guys let me bring that clarity see so this is that posterior cord of the brachial plexus in the axilla and this posterior cord of the plexus in the axilla becomes the radial nerve now this radial nerve travels at the back of the humerus in that very popular area that you guys know as that spiral groove okay now somewhere in the lower third of the humerus this nerve wraps around the humerus to come in front because at the elbow it has to travel in front of the lateral epicondyle here so here this nerve is lying in front of the lateral epicondyle this radial nerve so please pay attention again up in the axilla the radial nerve is lying posteriorly because it is a continuation of this posterior cord of the brachial plexus and here it's traveling in its spiral groove somewhere in the lower third of the arm it wraps around the humerus to come anteriorly traveling in front of the lateral epicondyle as it enters the forearm now just as the radial nerve enters the forearm it finishes khatam ho jati so there is no radial nerve in the forearm clear with that here this radial nerve finishes by bifurcating into a superficial branch that goes to the dorsum of the hand for the sensory supply and here a deep branch comes up that pierces a muscle in the proximal forearm that is supinator and then that this deep branch goes to the back of the hand and supplies any damp thing on back of the hand and this deep branch is what we call as posterior intraosseous nerve clear now please here in front of the lateral epicondyle the radial nerve supplies this muscle extensor carpi radialis longus the word carpi basically means wrist so the extensor of the wrist is supplied by the radial nerve itself right at the elbow so if extensor of the wrist is coming from this radial nerve only what would this pa and do on back of the forearm i would tell you pan at the back of the forearm basically supplies the finger extensors getting it so in a simple way if you talk about this radial nerve it is supplying the wrist extensors but when you talk of this posterior intraosseous nerve that is supplying the finger extensors clear with that so are you clear with that so if the radial nerve will be gone you will have a wrist drop but if the pan will be gone you will have a finger drop got my message so posterior intraosseous nerve injuries give you finger drops so drop at these metacarpophalangeal joint these knuckles radial nerve injuries give you wrist drop clear in pan injury if pan is injured the wrist can still be extended by this radial nerve that is supplying the ecrl muscle extensor carpi radialis longus carpi means wrist so are you guys clear with this and median nerve palsy you are absolutely right pen test is also there for median nerve palsy okay uh, car test is for ulnar nerve palsy ap thumb is for median nerve palsy so there are signs of other nerve injuries montagia fracture would be actually an injury to radial nerve or to be specifically the pan branch and i hope you are clear how to specify or how to decide whether it is radial nerve injury or pan injury so are you guys clear with this can i have a thumbs up if you guys are clear with this concept
यहां तक चीजें समझ में आ गई कैन हैव दैट थम्स अप प्लीज सो 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 आर यू वाइज क्लियर पल्लव चांदनी स्टैलिन अब्दुल रोहित ऐश शेखर आर यू वाइज ऑल क्लियर विद दिस वंडरफुल ने हाँ यू आर क्लियर विद दैट रोहित इज क्लियर पल्लव परफेक्ट नाउ परफेक्ट नाउ परफेक्ट नाउ सो सो आई होप यू वाइज आर क्लियर विद दिस this picture so just make it as a snapshot in your mind uh, beautifully explains to you the course of the radial nerve okay and how this nerve turns into this pin and mind you if you ask me the shortest nerve in the upper limb will be the radial nerve because it's just a nerve in the arm there is no radial nerve in the forearm perhaps okay so i hope you guys are clear with this clear with this clear with this okay a very simple one to end up a very simple one to end up a question from the previous fmd exam a simple question but many people perished axillary crutch paralysis is related to which now so quickly give me the answer so axillary crutch paralysis is related to which now such a simple one yes axillary crutch paralysis is basically related to which now so please please guys put in your choices no negative marking as i always in my class a mistake here would simply be a memory so please feel free to commit mistakes in a class you have the license to commit mistakes all right very nice right very nice pallav uh, nayana please 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 not axillary enough i know some people get caught up axillary axillary wo match ho jata hai and then they think b is the answer please don't do that uh, nayana you've been answering so well and then you know you faulted over here and surya same with you the answer here is radial now see crutch is something that you keep posteriorly in the axilla that is how you walk with the crutch and the nerve that is lying posteriorly in the axilla that's the radial nerve you very well understand that and you've just seen the diagram so actually crutch paralysis is radial nerve palsy so please in crutch paralysis radial nerve is gone in the axilla then there is a palsy called a saturday night palsy this is again a radial nerve palsy but this is a palsy that happens in that spiral groove and i'm sure there will be some positive examples also in the class that binge of alcohol on a saturday you're sitting in the chair the chair presses into the spiral groove that's also radial nerve palsy here you have this drops and we have just discussed a palsy of the radial nerve in the forearm its montilla fracture and to be specific this is pan injury posterior interosseous nerve injury. wherever radial nerve will be gone you will have wrist drops wherever pan will be gone you will have just finger drops wrist can be extended by the radial nerve clear with that so i hope you guys are a little bit uh you know rejuvenated by these questions on nerve injuries so please read this topic nicely expect more questions from this area okay so i hope the problems that we began with well the beginning of the class that internet issue that technical issues were all sorted i hope you could grasp something and you've taken home some messages from this class so any queries you want to ask me before i close the session for today so so koi cheez samajh mein nahi hai you want to repeat something uh anything that was not clear to you or you had a concept that was different from mine on a particular zone clear pallav so stalin nayana sekar sanjay neha vishnu abdul rohit comfortable clear with most of the things today clear with most of the things so i hope things are clear enough to you guys so just in case you wish to learn more from me you can want to attend more free classes you can check up this app an academy okay but yes if you want to maximize your benefit best is to subscribe you can subscribe to an academy plus or or you can even go with the iconic subscription where you have you know everything given to you in one combo pack at an offer price that is highly subsidized you can check up the app and you'll find all the prices over there okay and you can use my code ortholive to get you 10% off also uh there are heavy sub you know discounts going on as of now so so just check it out and in case you know you're preparing for these upcoming exams don't you know lose this uh, discount part 
you can use my code also when you're subscribing and you know you'll get that extra off that'll be for you so that's all for the session today okay so beneath you want me to revise the salter harris classification for you i'll certainly do that before i close the session so salter and harris is a classification of the growth plate injuries so suppose this is the lower femur and this is the epiphysis of the femur okay so what you would find in type 1 will be a growth plate separation so what i mean by that suppose this is metaphysis this is epiphysis this would be the growth plate or the physis growth plate is also called physis so epiphysis metaphysis would separate in type 1 injury when you will go to type 2 injury there would certainly be a separation but this separating epiphysis would be carrying with it this small chip from the metaphysis so type 2 injury may when you go to this type 2 injury this slipping epiphysis carries this metaphysical chip now in type 1 and type 2 growth plate physis is injured but epiphysis is intact epiphysis may koi damage nahi hota so when you go to type 3 the metaphysis is all okay you find epiphysial fractures to ye epiphysis break ho jati hai so this is epiphysis that is broken now here epiphysis is intact but here epiphysis is broken in type 3 and type 4 is almost similar here so if this is the metaphysis this is the epiphysis so this epiphysis this broken epiphysis would have that metaphysical chip so in a simple way when you find epiphysis intact that's one or two when you find epiphysis broken that is three or four you find metaphysical chips they are even number of types last type is type 5 which is basically a growth plate crushing physical crushing the growth plate is basically crushed clear so we need you're clear with the five types of growth plate injuries so this is a very very popular classification for growth plate injuries in children that is called a salter harris classification growth plate is also called physis so this is a classification for physial injuries so can we have your thumbs up beneath and close up the session so clear with salter harris classification perfect enough so that's all from my side uh, i thank you all guys for your patience now this is a telegram group i run t.me dr mukul ortho telegram i know you guys very well know it's just an app like whatsapp so you can connect to this group and stay updated about the further classes and best is to subscribe using this code and getting your discounts also like so good night for today we'll be looking forward to catching up again soon bye bye